Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. Today is January the 27th, 2022, and today's topic discussion is titled The Rematch of Kemet, How Language Can Help Answer the Question of Identity. So we're going to talk about ancient Egyptian ethnic identity, uh, include some of the racial discussion, all that and more when we return in just a bit. Welcome, welcome to the Mbongi. Again, I am your host, Asar Mhotep. And today is a glorious day. Hope everyone is doing well and doing something slightly different today. Uh, not in regards to the programming itself, but the StreamYard program now allows for the streaming directly into twitter so with the plan that i got i can only uh stream in three locations so i am currently streaming on youtube of course the asar imhotep facebook page and now on my twitter account the only thing with the twitter account is that they don't allow you to um schedule the show like to let everybody know that uh, the show is coming. So uh, hopefully that will be a feature So uh, in the near future. So if you're on Twitter, you'll just have to catch it when you catch it, you know, um, unless you are a part of some of my uh, other media streams. So I want to thank each and every one of you. And if you make a comment, it won't show up uh, on the Twitter here in this particular space. So I'm just testing out the, the Twitter and see how that does. But um, I'm, I'm glad that we can finally stream on Twitter with StreamYard. And so I want to welcome everyone and thank those who have uh, joined the conversation and made themselves known in the chat. Uh, peace and blessings to OG Gorilla and to Teti Ursama Atsuneferu. Jagad Davis is in the building. Brother Chavez is in the building. Sister Tamika is in the building. And Ty Lackey is in the building. And of course, uh, all of you who are watching on Facebook and then uh, uh, any new folks who may be watching, you know, here on Twitter as well. So, you know, in the, in the near future, we'll, uh, you know, kind of build that up. And so I'm just kind of testing the waters right now and all that good stuff. And so peace and blessings, pure black. Thank you for joining. And thank you for joining Jehuti Ma'at. Always good to have each and every one of you in the building. And for those of you who are listening live, and of course, those of you who are catching the archive, make sure that you like and thumb up the building. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel just yet, I'm going to need you to... That's right. Along with your likes, make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell so that you get all the notices when we do these live shows. And so 
you know, today's a very important topic. Peace and blessings to DJ Rock, Baltimore's best. Peace and blessings to you, what's happening. And to Sylvia Stewart, always nice to have you in the building. Thank each and every one of you once again. So as I was stating, the conversation is an ongoing conversation. We, we've we been having this, this who are the ancient Egyptians conversation for like, who knows, since the beginning of Egyptology. But what, what I'm going to focus on is something that not too many people really kind of kind of deal with when when addressing this subject <laughs> and this this is something that is really easy to to deal with and so you know hopefully uh the the lesson learned here today will help us you know to progress a bit further along in this discussion peace and blessings uh, Amedics82, thank you for joining. And Pure Black says, bet Asabi tweeting Diop quotes. Indeed, you know, I always, always show love and and raise the name of our, our ancestor, the late Dr. Shek, onto Diop. And so, you know, speaking of Diop, this has been a conversation piece in many of his works in terms of trying to identify just who are the ancient Egyptians. And, you know, it's it's kind of the conversation is kind of convoluted because, of course, you know, especially here in the Americas and in Europe, uh, the conversations when it comes to human achievement is often very racialized. And so when it comes to the ancient Egyptians, uh, European researchers are trying to argue that one, Egypt's not even in Africa, it's in this mythological Middle East, and that the so-called Black Africans have little or nothing to do with ancient Egypt except being some slaves, although they are also argue simultaneously that they didn't have slaves. So <laughs> the... Uh, so the the conversation is is kind of heated and you know more recently in the social media sphere we're still having this conversation and everybody's trying to bring everything else into the conversation except the important stuff that answers the questions and so now uh it, it's it, it's time that we deal with this so uh, peace and blessings. Just want to shout out a few more folks who have joined the chat. Aaron Edwards, Hotep, thank you for joining. And this is uh, and peace and blessings to Negus Negist. Now, sorry, you know those white Asiatics started ancient Egyptian civilization. You know, leave it leave it up to some scholars. They'll 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 argue that uh, if we leave them unchecked. Peace and blessings to Shitolo, Shia, and Bayabo. Uh, Chiluba, Baluba people in the building. Uh, Pure Black is in the building. He says, damn, so I was trolling. My bad, I didn't catch a troll. <laughs> uh, it says, sorry, starting, they, they dark skin. You know, we're going to get into all that, you know. And it, it's, it's, it's going to be it's going to be quite simple. And peace and blessings to Sister Darnisha. C. Pickett in the building. Good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining. And yes, it, it's, 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 it's really, it's really simple. And so without further ado, I'm just, I'm just going to go into the conversation. So I'm going to share my screen and I think, I don't know if I'm going to go full screen. Let's go. So boom, let me see how it looks. And I still got the old city on there. So the rematch, how language can help answer the question of identity. So again, the primary conversation that has been had is whether the ancient Egyptians are black or not. And, and oftentimes when people say black, they the, the question is, are they black? like the quote-unquote Yoruba people. The Yoruba 
become the standard of the so-called Negro race. So all black folks much mat must match the Yoruba people to be considered uh, black. And this has been problematic since the beginning, especially in a, in a number of research papers where when they want to talk about sub-Saharan African ancestry in the lineage, they want to include the the Yoruba as the the true Negro standard. And then everything else is really kind of an admix of Eurasians, whatever that is, and uh and and Negroes from the past. So <laughs> the when you like do a search and you uh enter into the parameters the the question what are the race of the ancient egyptians and you know uh depending on what what side of the argument you are on you will you know either come up with a whole bunch of folks saying that they were black and then of course there are those who say that they were Caucasians. And then you have those who claim that they're neither black nor Caucasian, they're Egyptian. So Egyptian is its own race, right? And so for those who like to say that they're more Caucasian or Eurasian, they like to, to use these images, you know, out of context, out of date. And what, what people have to understand is that ancient Egypt was an African society. And because it bordered the Levant, and because the Levant was going through uh, a series of droughts, remember, even in the biblical story, the reason why, you know, uh, Abraham and all them uh, and, and the Israelites went into Egypt initially is because of drought. And so, you know, they found themselves in the Delta marshes. The Nile River and its flooding was was a bit more generous than waiting on the rains in in the Levant. And so there since pre-dynastic times, there have been a number of Eurasians who have migrated and settled and moved in and moved out. Nomads, people who are semi nomads and people who were settled. And so what happens is, is that you have a number of so-called Eurasian speakers and, and, and people who have settled in parts and trickled in small numbers and then later on during Egyptian history in, in larger numbers. And because they're integrated inside, there's, there's no racism like, like we have today. So there's no, no ghettoizations, you know, there's no you know, if, if if you act accordingly, you can rise up in the ranks and just be a part of the citizenry. So the artwork is going to reflect their presence there. But what happens is, is that these that scholars will take these images and try to say that these are the Egyptians. Now, ancient Egypt was throughout its history, a multi-ethnic uh, so-called multiracial, and I don't even like using that term, but you you had various different type of phenotypic expressions uh, there. But the dominant uh, folks who were there were so-called Black African people. And they don't like to show that artwork. When they want to show the ancient Egyptians, they want to show these images. Of, of of stylistic, you know, Eurasians with with African hairstyles because of the style of the artwork itself, and and they're really walking around as if these these folks are the Egyptians, and in many ways they are. So when you say Egyptian, Egyptian is really just a citizen of ancient Egypt. And so anybody who has settled and had children and have raised, you know, in the uh, in the territory of what is what we call Egypt today 
is an Egyptian. And so they're not wrong. But what they'll do is when there are black African images, they'll automatically say that those are Nubians and they're not the Egyptians. And this is problematic. And so when we dealing with this question, we're going to deal with this a little differently. And so when they show you images of ancient Egyptians, you know, and the cops, they'll, they'll show these images here right these these are from the very very late period you know in a greco-roman period and later of the cops so when you see these images they'll say like you know the 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 ancient egyptians look just like the modern egyptians you can see it in the old artwork but this doesn't tell you the full story so i want y'all to keep this this image in your head throughout uh, our conversation, right? Keep these images. And so these, these are descendants of ancient Egyptians. Remember that to be an Egyptian was just simply be a citizen. It's just like if I was an American, uh, in, in terms of me being an American, I'm an American citizen because America is the country. America is the territory. But because I am American, does that, does that make me Cherokee? Does that necessarily make me um, Aztecan? Or whatever the, the real word is uh, for, the, for the ethne. Somebody could correct me in the chat. No. And so there's a difference between being a citizen and descendant of citizens of the country and being the Remetch. Because the Remetch is an ethnic identity. That's what the, the founders called themselves. And this is a critical clue to discovering who they are and where they came from. And so even when you do you you see a lot of these studies, right? Genetic studies in these in these reconstructions of the ancient Egyptians, right? And so we have this this study here: uh, the faces of three ancient Egyptians brought to life using two thousand year old DNA. And so people think that DNA is going to tell you something about who the ancient Egyptians are. And what people don't realize is that DNA studies in ancient Egypt is in its, in its infant stages. There's not been that many mummies that have been fully mapped. And even the ones that have, they're primarily from the Delta area and from the later kingdom when there was uh, a, a higher influx of Eurasians. So you, you get information like this that will claim that the that the ancient egyptians in terms of a total population clusters more with eurasians right and i find this very problematic for several reasons which we'll get into now but i want you all to keep in mind and just keep you know this in your mind as well these these faces that are reconstructed you know, and, and look at the dates for this 776 between 776 and 569 BCE. Right. This is this is late, late in Egyptian uh, history. This, this is close to the Persian, Libyan invasions. Uh, uh, a little bit after this is going to be the Greek invasions. And then after the Greeks is going to be the Romans. And so, so just keep this image in mind. And so when you, when you see these images of these individuals, you know, just going back a few slides, so we keep this, see how they look, right? And see, see the reconstructions for the faces. 
But look at the actual artwork of the foreigners, the people who are Asiatics. You'll see that these reconstructions and these later forms are closer to the Egyptian artwork for the quote unquote Asiatics. And this is going to be very important. So look at this, this artwork. So this is a block from a relief depicting a battle, possibly reign of Amenhotep II during uh, the 18th dynasty from Upper Egypt, Thebes, Asasif Temple, Ramesses IV, um, MMA excavations, da, 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 1427 to 1400 BC, right? So the, these are Asiatics. This is what Asiatics look like. Here's some more Asiatic captives. This is from the, uh, again from the Ramesside period, Dynasty 20. So you can see on the right hand side, the, the uh, you know, at least what's left of them. Um, you can still see that even with the damage, it still looks like this, this uh, Boudin over here on the left hand side, right? From that era. And so they don't they don't look too different. This is what the Eurasiatics look like. So the the depictions that we saw, you know, earlier, and then what we're seeing in the artwork from the ancient Egyptians concerning the Asiatics, they're they're closer in range. So when you see, for example, this tomb painting depicting Syrian Amorite women migrants, 12th Dynasty, Kanun Hotep at Beni Hassan, right? That that kind of looks like those those people who are being um touted as ancient egyptians so let's go back so we can be consistent when we when we look at these they they fall in alignment with those asiatics that we saw you know earlier and when they do the dna studies from around this time period that's exactly what you see in in the in the dna studies right and they'll try to claim that you know these people always been here and that's that's just what the ancient egyptians look like right and so you know here's another famous from the same um kanum hotep the second beni hassan dynasty 12 tomb and that's what they look like they there there's there's you know slight variation but continuity in the artwork in the later artwork in terms of the cops and even in the reconstruction of the ancient egyptian there's a, there's a continuum that you see with those groups right but the problem is when the ancient egyptians depicted themselves they don't look nothing like the asiatics going back they don't look nothing like them. The question you have to ask is when they're depicting themselves, why do they depict themselves so differently, so much darker, with different phenotypic features in the vast majority of their artwork? What, what I'm looking for in the artwork is ancient Egyptian reliefs where the vast majority of the people who are labeled as Egyptians look like this or look like this in terms of their women, right? Or look like this or even look like this. Where in the artwork of the native ancient Egyptian phenotype do you see this representation in abundance? Where's that continuity in terms of appearance? Why do they depict themselves like this? But then in the later period, they all of a sudden find all the light pigmentation paint and, and can draw straight hair and things of that nature. But throughout their 3,000 year history, for some reason, everything just defaulted to, to dark, to uh, reddish brown skin, afros with, with certain style hair, 
that we'll get in that we see here, for example, in terms of what? Why do we see they just look so vastly different? And and this is what we're going to get into today. And thank you to uh, Octo Thorpe for uh, your super chat. Uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you again. And I'll put this here for those who want to support the channel. And so now we're going to go into uh, a few biblical sources that tell us exactly where the ancient Egyptians are from. <laughs> and so many people may not be familiar with this name in the Bible. Now, keep in mind, the Bible's not a history book. Just like many other mythologies, their mythologies are, are centered in real life places with real life people. And there's certain histories that are included in the mythology, although the, the nature of many of the events may not be historically accurate and or correct at, in, on any level. And so we, we always have to be careful about uh you know looking at myths and so there's a there's a way that we that we look at the myths and so there is a a place called pathros that's that you'll find in the bible and what is pathros it says here and this is from wiki which is egyptian pateresi the south land in the septuagint Gay Patharu, Pathores, the Hebrew form of the Egyptian name for Upper Egypt. And these are the verses in which you will find it. And so further, this is kind of how it looks in the Hebrew writing here. Uh, Pathros, and of course, in the Greek, Pathores, or Pathores, and Coin Greek, Pathores, Pathores. And again, refers to Upper Egypt, primarily the Thebaid. It is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible in Jeremiah 44 and 1 and 15, Isaiah 11 and 11, Ezekiel 29 and 14, 30 and 14. And it is the homeland of the Pathru, Pathrusism, uh, Pathrusim. Um, I guess it's supposed to be uh, Pathrusim. Um, because you know, with the with the Hebrew, the the plural being I am. Um, so this is key here because in the modern discussions, there is this notion that these Eurasians came into Egypt and brought their superior intellect and technology and just built up ancient Egypt. And then they just left without a trace. Right? But the people in Asia knew where the Egyptians were from. And even in their mythology, they informed us where they are from. So when you say Pathros in his various pronunciations, it actually comes from an Egyptian word. It's an Egyptian loan word from pa taresi, or this or the land resi meaning southern or the south. Oh, so, the, so the south land, right? As in the Hebrew and Greek, the term was used in Akkadian by the Assyrians as paturisi. For example, in the annals of Asar Hadan, right? So this is a native Egyptian name that is uh, 
you know, pronounced variously in Greek and in Hebrew. But this is the, uh, it's just like when you say Egypt. Egypt is an actual Egyptian word from, you know, Het Ka Pata, which is a temple location, you know, in Egypt, which became just a name for the area and then somehow became the modern name of the entire territory. So when you, when they say the Thebaid, the this kind of is uh, you know according to like the uh, the the Greek and Roman sources kind of the territory at the time, and you can see in this map here where it says Thebaid, which is this part here in the southern part of ancient Egypt, and so kind of pay attention to where the border is in terms of the Sinai Peninsula. So it's a little bit, you know, um, just above the, you know, saying the edge, the bottom edge of the Sinai Peninsula. It goes all the way down to this little, little hook, this small little peninsula you see over here on in the right hand corner. But in the in the where it says Thebae or Thebes, that's where Luxor is. And so you can kind of get an idea from there. And so in this second map here, this is kind of an elongated version of, you know, upper and lower Kemet. Remember that upper Kemet is what in our modern day would be the south and lower Kemet would be our modern north. So when they say the upper Egyptians, they're talking about this area here where, where Nubia and Egypt meet. And this is very important because in all the studies, again, when they're talking about the Eurasians, they, they all are concentrated in the Delta area, which is here in terms of uh, large numbers. And But everyone recognizes that the population is going to get darker once you um, start going into Upper Egypt. And so this is going to be very important. So this is Kom Ombo, Aswan, you know, again, here's uh, Thebes, Luxor, this area right here. All this is, all this is uh, uh, essentially Nubia and Ta Seti. But this is Upper Egypt, Ta Seti, Nubia, all this in this area right here. And so this is, this is where the so-called Sub-Saharan Africans were located in Egypt, right? And this is this is the argument that they'll make. And so let's read some of these these scriptures that were given to us earlier. And what was this text me? Um, <laughs> so the word that came to Jeremiah. This is this Jeremiah forty four and one and uh, fifteen. So the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell at Migdal and Tafanhes and Nof, and I know I'm mispronouncing that um, incorrectly, and in the country of Pathros, which is Upper Egypt. Now we go into uh, the verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, and then it continues. So they understood that, you know, in Egypt is Pathros. This is the south. It's, it's called the southern land. Or it's actually the head, because rest means the, it's a word for the head, the beginnings. Remember that the Egyptians came from the south. And the, the, the biblical writers knew and understood this, this history. And so we go unto Isaiah 11, 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Now, in this verse, it makes it seem like the Egypt and Pathros are two separate areas, you know, and from Egypt and from Pathros, but Pathros is Upper Egypt. 
This could be telling us something here. However, when you get to Ezekiel 29 and 14, and then you can get to, I don't know why it says 44, but it should be 30 and 14 at the bottom. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt. So this is this is God speaking, uh, allegedly God speaking. And you know, so he's saying these words. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. And I will make Pathros desolate and will set fire in Zoan. And will execute judgments in no, I don't even know why I stopped there. Right. So, but what what is this that I have in red? Return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation. And this is the King James 1611 translation, right? So, of course, I had to, to look at a number of translations. So let's look at this from the American Standard Version. It gets a little bit more clear of what is being said here. I'll restore the economy of Egypt and return them to the land of Pathros from which they originated and there they will remain an insignificant kingdom. Right? So I'll restore the economy of Egypt and return them, the Egyptians, to the land of Pathros, to Upper Egypt, from which they originated. So they're saying that the Egyptians originated in Upper Egypt. Let's look at the International Standard Version. They say the same thing. I'll restore the economy of Egypt and return them to the land of Pathros, from which they originated. And there they will remain an insignificant kingdom. Right. Then let's let's look at Young's literal translation. And I have turned back to the the captivity of Egypt and I have brought them back to the land of Pathros, to the land of their birth. And they have been there a low kingdom. To the land of their birth. So let's look at the words that they're using here. So. um into the land of their habitation. That's kind of ambiguous, but it gets clear. The land from which they originated, originated the land of their birth. Let's look at the Orthodox Jewish Bible and see what translation they have. And I will bring back the captives of Mitzrayim. That's what they call Egypt and will cause them to return into Eretz Patros. Eretz is the word, the Hebrew word for land or earth, the land of Patros, into the land of their ancestry. And they shall be there a lowly mamlachak or kingdom. So in all these translations, they're telling you where the ancient Egyptians come from. There was, there was no misunderstanding in ancient times who the Egyptians were and where they originated from. That's why you will never find a contradiction on the, in the Greek records on the, what the color of the ancient Egyptians were. And you would not find a contradiction in the Bible about where the Egyptians, who the Egyptians were and where they're from. Why didn't they say lower Egypt? Why didn't they say in the Delta? Why did they say in upper Egypt where all the dark skinned folks is? Where all the so-called Nubians are? Why did they say that's the land of their ancestry? the place of their birth. Why is that important for this conversation? Because when we're having these conversations of where the ancient Egyptians come from, everybody else in ancient times, when we use the classic model here, understood this fact of life. 
but we have people in the modern day that think they know better than the than the people who were living among them in terms of what they look like and where they're from. So again, this is Upper Egypt and Kom Ombo and Aswan and Phile, Abu Simbel. All this is Nubia here. Remember that little other um, small peninsula I talked about right here? This is where we're at. So you, all this here, just the, the Thebaid, the border is just under Aswan in Nubia. This is important because we don't talk about this in the conversation when they want to talk about these random uh, DNA, M this, L that. DNA all DNA conversations all out of context. And this is why it's important here. Because if you're going to do ancient Egyptian studies in terms of DNA and things, if you want to get to the real Egyptians, you have to uh take mummies from the from the old Middle Kingdom from Upper Egypt and Nubia. Because that's where the record's saying that these folks originated from. Why would you be in the Delta with the Eurasiatics and then be like, the ancient Egyptians, you know, they, they cluster closer with the, the Eurasians. This is the trick that they pull. And you always have to be cognizant in this. And this is why you have to read these ancient records and juxtapose them and triangulate. This is what we do when we're trying to find places to dig. You got to kind of piece things together so you just don't be randomly digging places that's not going to, uh, you know, give you any reward for your efforts. And so you have people doing DNA studies in the wrong places. Because we want to know who are those ancient Egyptians that founded the, the civilization itself. And with the Egyptian records and Greek records and even in the Hebrew records, they're telling you Upper Egypt is where they are from. And so this is just a, a, a kind of a timeline Starting with, you know, 3100, 3200, A group, C group, Kerma, the colonial period and the Paten period, et cetera, et cetera, going all the way into 1500 AD in terms of uh, ancient Kemet. We can go further than that, A group being 38,000 to 3100 BCE. This is the pre-dynastic and first dynasty, right? B group, Tasseti, first through fifth dynasty. Tasseti is before you get into uh, Upper Egypt proper. Matter of fact, Tasseti is kind of really Upper Egypt. It's, it's an overlap. And so we got, you know, to, to examine the work of, of like George A. Reisner, for example, right? And and start looking at these artifacts. This is classical Nubia, you know, um, 5,960 to 5030 uh, BC. It says before present. And so you just might take 2,000 years off. So this is really kind of 3,960 um, and 3,000 between 3,030 BCE in terms of these particular. Uh, audio artifacts in Nubia. The beginnings of the civilization and the black top wear, which is going to become very, very important. In the, in the jewelry, and this is kind of stuff that was being traded all up and down the Nile. And then, of course, it, it is evident that, you know, the, the archaeology supports what the biblical study 
talks about. So, you know, here in classical Nubia, you have the Kistal incense burner where you, you see the emblems of the first uh, signs of kingship, where you see the king wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, the white crown. And you see the bull and all the, all the emblems that are associated with kingship. You see Horus on the incense burner. This is 3850 uh, to 3100 BCE. This is in Nubia, Upper Egypt, Pathros, the place in which the Egyptians are from. So we start here. You don't start in Asia. You don't start in the Levant. You start here. Because this is where all the records, all the archaeology is stating that this, this dynastic culture and everything derived from. And so what they have here is the A group refers to a, a culture found in northern Nubia between Aswan and the second cataract in far south Egypt up to the modern border of Sudan. An incense burner from Kistal has the image of a falcon and a man wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. It shows that kingship, civilization, and history were simultaneous in Nubia and Kemet. In this early period, Nubia was referred to as Ta Seti. They were buried in simple oval or round pits called tumuli with shell, stone, jewelry pots, and stone pallets for grinding cosmetics. This is where Egypt starts, in Taseti. And then they move and they conquer, you know, further up into uh, the delta. And by the time you see the Narma pallet, they're, pallet they're, they're kicking out and, and, and taking over the territory from the from the migrating and invading um, Asiatics who are coming into the area, reconquering their ancestral land all the way up to the Delta. And so this is just a picture of the Magi, some more of the, the black top wear, and here's one of the burial tumuli that you uh, we spoke of early in the Akata period. This is pre-Kerma. And see some of the 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 early graphics and 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 writing. And so even even when we get into the so-called twenty fifth Nubian dynasty, they're telling you something here in this the Shabaka stone, right? And so this is just from the first section of the Shabaka stone, and it says the the living Horus. Excellent two, uh, excellent two lands, the two ladies, excellent two lands, the golden Horus, excellent two lands, king of upper and lower Egypt, Neferkare, the son of Ra, Shabaka, beloved of Ptah south of his wall, who lives like Ra forever. This writing was copied out anew by his majesty, Shabaka, in the house of his father, Ptah south of his wall. For his majesty found it to be a work of the ancestors, which was warm eaten, worm eaten, so that it could not be understood from beginning to end. His majesty copied it anew so that it became better than it had been before in order that his name might endure and his monument last in the house of his father, Bata south of his wall throughout eternity, as a work done by the son of Ra Shabaka for his father, Bata Chenin, so that he might live forever. Why, if, if the Nubians were so foreign and so separate from the ancient Egyptians, why would he reference this in terms of his uh, ancestors? Like this is the work of his ancestors because these are different families, different groups that are all related to each other that have been cycling rulership throughout ancient Egyptian history. And so when it comes to the so-called quote unquote Nubian dynasty, this is this is another Nubian dynasty. All the, the legit dynasties are quote unquote Nubian dynasties. And so there's there was no changing 
and during the 25th dynasty of the language, there was no imposition of some foreign language using the hieroglyphs in this period. They understood all that. There might be some slight nuances, but that's because they're, they're, they're related languages of the same language, of the same ancestral language, I should say. But Egyptologists would read this and, and think that they were trying to be funny, that they were, that Shavaka was lying, like he just wanted to be down with the Egyptians, so he put that line in there. The lengths that they'll go to try to deny the connection between uh, so-called Nubia and ancient Kemet. And so now we get into this this title here this is the phrase remetch and kemet the people of kemet <laughs> what people have to understand is that this is their ethnic name remetch and so the remetch the word literally means people or human being or person in the singular and then people in the plural, right? And also man or male or husband, because it, it just, that's that's where it derives from. Where it ultimately derives from a word meaning body and then body part and then phallus and then that's how it became man. And then, you know, man becoming neuter for just mankind. So that's how it means human being, people, et cetera, et cetera. But this this is a clue again to who they are and where they come from. And it's important for the linguistics to, to help answer the question here. So for example, you have two dominant language groups in the Levant and in North Africa uh, natively, right? And excuse me as I uh, drink from this big ass water jug. Oops. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so here's, here's where all of this comes together. The ethnic name for the Egyptians, they didn't call themselves Egyptians. They didn't call themselves Kometians. They didn't call themselves Tamarians. Their name, the people who originated and founded the civilization of Kemet, they called themselves Remetch. And it's Romi or Lomi in Coptic. Right? So, this should tell you something. Because if the word, if this is what they call themselves, the people, right? Sons and daughters of the soil. That's ultimately what we mean when we say Remetchen Kemet. Sons and daughters of the soil. But if, for example, that the Egyptians were closer or came from the Berber people, we would expect in the language of the Berbers for the word for man to be remetch. But when we look into the Berber languages, which you'll see here on the left-hand side, right? And I got these, got these words from a book on how to do historical comparative linguistics with Semitic. And so it's just, they just have all the basic words that you would use to, to do your comparisons with. So look at the words in the Berber column for man. Ataras, Wugi'id, Argaz, Aryaz, Argaz, Argaz. Not Remetch or Romi or Lomi. Let's look into the Semitic languages. Zikaru in Akkadian, in Ugaritic, Met, 
And I think that's actually a borrowing from Egyptian, from the word for penis and man. Because it's the only Semitic language with that uh, consonant clustered together. In Syriac, gabra, and that actually comes from a root uh, GBR, which means to be strong or powerful. It has a cognate in the Yoruba language and in the phrase or the, the title for Eshu, you know, in, um, would you say Eshu Akbara, Elek Bara, you know, is Eshu the powerful. And so, so even that word for man is really just a word for power, for strength, for strong. And then you have an Arabic, Raju, Ngeez, Khid, Be'isi, Gheg, and then Esh in Hebrew, Geber in Hebrew, and Malula, Brona, and then Gheg and Jibali again. None of this matches Rematch. Let's look for the word for person or human being. So we go into Berber again. These are the words for person or human being in Berber. Essentially the same words that were in the first uh, column. I mean, the first uh, table. Then you get into Semitic. Adam. For, for Hebrew, for a person or human being. Syriac, Nasha, Arabic, Insan, Gaez, Be'esi, Machlula, Barnash, Jabali, Berdem, Akkadian, Awilu, Ugaretic, Adam, Bunushu. You notice that in the Berber, there's some kind of consistency with the majority of the languages. But then when you get into Semitic, even the word for person or human being, there's, there's no consistency between the languages. But And none of them even sound remotely like Ramech. This is important. And we, ha we have to have this conversation. And so from that same text that I, that I talked about, you know, you, you see the word for person in... There's, there's a lot more Semitic languages that were given. So you see all of these here. Um, you know, these are all Semitic languages. You have to get the text to see what all the uh, abbreviations are. But this is Arabic here, Ugaritic, you know, Syriac. But you see, there's, there's very little, uh, this is Phoenician, Adam, very little consistency between these languages and none of them matches what we find in, in Egypt. However, when you go into the African languages, because remember what I said, remetch means husband, man, people, person, human beings. And so um, as I stated in Luja Volume 2, reflexes of this root can be found in a variety of African languages. For example, Kinandeo, Mulume, Timbo, Mulume, Chiluba, Mulume, Mbochi, Olomi, Husband, Man, Source, you know, being a New Era, Ram, Person, Human, Individual, Azir, Rime, Rime, Child. It's a, a semantic shift. And there's and there's a reason for that, which is discussed in the text. In Shango, lo, he, she. In Somali, ab, male. In the Dogon, dime, person. In Sumerian, dom, spouse. It could be husband or wife. In Dinka, ran, man. And that Azir is uh, basically a, a, a Songhai language, basically um, a branch of the Mande languages in, in West Africa, right? And so Obinga in his 1993 text, he gives us these variations of, of the word that you'll find. So you'll find what he, you know, in the R series where the initial consonant is R. And so in New Air, Ram, person, human being, individual, Azir, Rime, Rime, child, semantic transfer. And then you have 
for the same meaning in the L series. That means the beginning, the first consonant is L. You know, you have Azir, so uh, Leme, Leme. Um, and so there's a R, um, a, a RL liquid interchange in, uh, in Azir. And common band to Lumi. And then Topoke, Lome, Kisonge, Mulume, Shiluba, Mulume, Mbali, Lumi, Pende, Mulimu, Mulumi, Kikongo, Inlumi, Lumi, Mulumi, Teke. These are all Bantu languages here um, uh, under the Azir uh, text. So from the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, et cetera, uh, in that area. So then you have an N series where the first initial R is nasalized and becomes N. So you had the Fang in Gabon, Nam in Pongwe, Onome, Onomo, Kuba, Noom, Noom, Vili, Nuni. And even, even um, in the Dogon, when you say Nomo, the Nomo, the first Nomo was a fish and but was the progenitor of the human beings which are also called nomo there's a in in the, the dogon languages noom or nom or nomo is a word for human being so they have both they have a d series and deme for person and then they have the n series part of the n series also in dogon so in this last one is it's a zero series that means the r or liquid is dropped and so it's just omi in, and Tetela, Lomongo, be Omi, the B being a, a nominal prefix, and Tomba, be Omi, Songa, and Momi, Mome, Amo, Aome, Aqua, Opa, Moomi, Baimi, or Bami, Moomi. All these variations of the same word meaning person, man, human being, husband right individual and so when you when you see a map of where the term for human being for man for person is let's go back remember in berber and semitic there's no variation of this word it doesn't exist in semitic or berber but when you go into Africa, it's all over the place. And so in, in biology, and we use this in linguistics, when they're trying to figure out the origin of a, a species, they have what they, they look for this, this thing called the place with the, they're looking for the place with the most diversity and the least moves. And so we can see that Remetch, Romi, because the ch in Remetch is a suffix. It's just Rom. So when we go all into Sudan, in Nuer, Ram, Afar, Numu, Noon, Dinka, Ran, Dinka, Lan, R L interchange, in Beha, Raba, M and N, uh, excuse me, M and B interchange. In Oromo, Oromo, the word Oromo itself is, is cognate with Remetch. And it means the free people, the free person, human being. In Somali, Lab, he, she. And then, of course, all these different variations you see in Congo, Gabon, Cameroon, and then the West African variants among the Azir and Songhai and Mande. And then over here, what you see is the two variations I mentioned in terms of the Dogon. And this this low here with the low tone, when in, in Songo, when the, when the second syllable or consonant is dropped, it is it reflects on the vowel, the preceding vowel is a low tone. So when we talk about the, and even in Sumerian, dam for spouse and urum, man, male. And so when we go by the principle of the most diversity and least moves, the Ramech could only have come from the quote unquote South because this is where you find the names. 
And so if they were Berber speakers or Semitic speakers or or Europeans, they would not come up here and make up a name and identify themselves with words that don't exist in their language. When, when the Egyptians, when the founding Egyptians came and created uh, ancient Egypt, they drew from their own language the word in which they identified themselves as the people. And because you can't find this amongst these groups, and then the groups over here in the Levant area are telling you that they come from here in Upper Egypt, Taseti, the Thebaid, it tells you where they came from and from what group of people they came from. And so the Egyptians are related to these folks here that you see in all these places. They're the ones who inherited the, these, this very basic word for human being, for person, for male, for man. And then derivative forms in terms of spouse, because the word means husband. And then it can also, it just, it just doubles as a word for spouse in general. So if the, again, if the ancient Egyptians came from, from Libya or, or, or Morocco or Asia, they would, they would have the name, the Ramech, they would have this, this grammatical feature at the end. I discussed this in the Luja volume one. It's, it's very basic. It's not hard. We know where the ancient Egyptians came from. They came from here. They brought their language, their culture, and they named themselves using a word from their language. They didn't borrow it from anywhere else. So it's it's interesting that if they came from Eurasia, they they went all the way here and named themselves after a name that doesn't exist in their language but batches all the so-called black African folks, the true Negroes in these different various spaces uh, in terms of the, their present location. And so it, it makes even more sense when you consider the fact that, for example, in 2018 and in 2019, there were several conferences, one at Brown University and one at the University of Texas in Austin in which they have come to the conclusion that the Semitic languages is not directly uh, related to the Egyptian language. And so one of the presenters, Dr. Aaron Wilson Wright, you know, wrote a chapter in a book that's coming out at the end of this year uh, on this subject, the, the proceedings from the conference, titled Rethinking the Relationship Between Egyptian and Semitic, the Morphological, Lexical, and Phonological Evidence, right? And in this, he says, although Egyptologists and Semiticists alike agree that Egyptian and Semitic are genetically related based on morphological evidence, they have yet to establish systematic sound correspondences between the two language families. The lack of sound correspondences in turn raises doubts about the relationship between Egyptian and Semitic and necessitates a renewed analysis of their shared features. In this talk, I will review the morphological, lexical, and phonological evidence for a genetic relationship between Semitic and Egyptian by comparing proto-Semitic and internally reconstructed Egyptian forms, a standard historical linguistic procedure that has helped establish numerous language families ranging from Indo-European to uto aztecan Based, and I have this bolded and in red, based on this comparison by doing the standard historical comparative method, I argue, I meaning Aaron Wilson Wright, argue that there is insufficient evidence to support a genetic relationship between Egyptian and Semitic. This is not to say that the two language families are not genetically related, only that it is impossible to detect a genetic relationship between them using 
current methodology. And so that would help to explain why you don't find a basic word like for human being or male coming out of the Semitic languages. And these are the folks who are coming in, trickling down the quote unquote Eurasians in settling in the Delta area where they're doing all, all this DNA studies from. When they need to be going into the older, upper Egyptian, old kingdom, middle kingdom to extract the DNA of large numbers of these folks, because these are the actual Romech, the Romis, the Lomi. That's their name. And so people, people like to forget history and be making all kind of nonsensical arguments on the net, being all kind of message boards, talking silliness. And it would help to explain, for example, when uh, the late Egyptologist Serge Sonaron, in his text, the ancient Egyptian priest, when he says, but for Egypt, the sea marks the limit of a world, of an African world. Thus the dreams of Ogotomeli or the Bantu philosophy carry precious elements which help us to understand better certain aspects of Egyptian religious thought. But we must expect to find little of platonic thought in this world. Why? Because these are the same group of folks. There's a reason why you can find ancient Egyptian thought or uh, in Bantu philosophy and Bantu philosophy and ancient Egyptian thought. Because they're all the Ramech, the ancestral Ramech in these places. And so when we when we look at the so-called skin maps in these areas, that's where the folks get darker. That's why they want to always concentrate in the Delta area, where it's allegedly lighter skin in, in the tips of North Africa and stuff. But to get to where the Egyptians are from, you have to go where it gets darker. And that's why when you see the actual carvings and stuff from the ancient Egyptians, it looks nothing like those initial um, those initial images that we saw at the beginning of the conversation. You don't see any of that. They, like you, I don't even know if you can see on this um on this image like just the 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 attention to the detail in terms of the skin color but even the shape of the sisters this person got a the, uh this sister has a sister shape and it's not by accident when you see nefertiti bust when you look all in this area over here this ain't no Eurasian behind. This is some some quote unquote sub-Saharan African body tropical body type that still exists to this day. So I, I side compare this with a woman from Rwanda that you can see the the same type of hip structure. Even, you know, the 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 little, you know, um, bump in the belly, the shape and everything. And notice that her color is the same as what you find in the ancient Egyptian drawings all the way down to Rwanda. So the, the Dinka type with the super dark black and tall, that's one African type in that area. Other African types look like this all the way down into Central Africa. And so those ladies at the beginning at the Coptic, they don't look like these sisters that you find in the ancient Egyptian um, artwork when the Egyptians drew themselves. Those people don't look like this. Where are these sisters in the Coptic drawings? Where are these brothers with their dark skin, brown skin, and afros? Where is this sister with her braids? They're not braiding like this. You don't see any artwork like this in the Middle East 
for their people. They're not, they're not throwing it up like this. And of course, we know this is the Magi. But you see how their froze and things are the same in the other artwork. So when you go to the museum and when you have these discussions, they want to show you those, those late period Coptic uh, period uh, Egyptians, those, those people mixed with Persian and, and Libyans and, and Eurasians and things like that and say those are the ancient Egyptians. When those same people are saying that the real Egyptians, their birthplace is in Tosseti, in Nubia. They're not showing you these, these images when we having these conversations. These aren't the anomaly. You will never, ever, ever, ever find a, a, a plethora of ancient Egyptian carvings or paintings where people look like the modern Egyptians in one scene. You won't find it. Who is this? Who is this person here? This don't look like why? Why when the ancient Egyptians depict themselves, it looks totally different than than the modern folks. They're really they're really trying to make it seem as if these Eurasians were coming over here with these uh, uh, hairstyles. They're really trying to pass them off. And, and try to argue with you and talk about these are wigs. Not knowing that African people wear their hair like this. This isn't a made up for stylistic carving. This is imitating actual African hair that you see over here. And these froze, this brother has the same fro as these brothers over here. And this Afar brother has the same hairstyle as his ancestors shown on this picture here. You're not coming from Asia with these hairstyles. Show me, show me natively a population in Asia when their artwork and they're depicting themselves that they look like this. Where, why don't they show you this artwork? with these sisters with these braids. These are common braids, common fro hairstyles, just everyday people. And they obviously had paint that they can paint in lighter skin. How come they never paint the lighter skin when they're depicting the, just the normal population? Where are these people at? This is from possibly uh, Nebhep Tare, uh, Mentuhotep II of the 11th Dynasty, his children. And it's not to say that you wouldn't find lighter skinned folks. They didn't have a racial prejudice. They were marrying and having children with all these Eurasian folks and Berbers and stuff like that. That's, that's, that's a given. But when they depict themselves, none of that Eurasian talk, they don't know what you're talking about. See, people want to throw just random DNA sequences and things, but won't show you artwork. And if you show them artwork, then they'll say it's lookership, all scholarship, all visual uh, things that you're looking at it. What constitutes lookership is if you just first look at something and then you don't have checks and balances in place in terms of your analysis, you just go with your first mind. That's lookership. But all inspectional aspects of study require for you to see and look. And so we're 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 combining multiple um streams of evidence it's a multidisciplinary conversation and when we put all of this together the only logical conclusion you can come to is that the 
the Hebrews were right in the Bible in terms of who they are. And it is backed up by the language and is backed up by the artwork, multiple streams of evidence. And so again, they'll try to pass this off as these were your these 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 dark whites, the so-called dark whites who came from Eurasia and settled into Egypt. Then try to tell you that these Afros are wigs. Like African people need wigs to come up with these styles. That the brown, reddish skin color, that's all symbolic. That the Afar weren't in ancient Egypt. That like this was just some symbolic hair color in terms of these, these, these cattle herders in ancient Egypt. While the, the while the people in in uh, uh, among the Afar in Sudan are still wearing their hair this way and still putting in the fats and oils to make their hair white, which is accurately depicted in the ancient Egyptian reliefs. And notice the skin color. And so they're still in, in Africa, especially in East Africa, putting the oils and fats on top of the head. You can't do this with Eurasian hair. All the butter and all this stuff will just melt. And, and I don't know if you've seen that kind of hair, just real greasy like on the wet. No, a wet dog and things. No. But among African people, this is what you see. And so I can't take people serious when they be having these conversations. You're not doing this on their on other folks' heads. Where are these sisters and brothers, these dark skinned, long hair? These aren't the people that you see in the in the in those on those artworks, in the reconstructions. These and this photo, they're labeled the Nubians. These are the just this is what the Egyptians look like. Their ancestors look like this. This is who you see in these photos with these African hairstyles, African skin complexions. There's a whole bunch of these. We can be here all day just looking at the photos. The skin color is not symbolic. This is their color. This is Tata Tata Ireland. Ugh, can't speak. Tut Amen on the left hand side, a modern uh, brother in Egypt. The Egyptians know what they they look like. Even when you look at the Nubian so called Nubian style wigs, why is it called a Nubian style wig? Why would you come from Eurasia and try to try to style a Nubian style wig? Who are you imitating? These are the people that they're trying to imitate. And just like in modern days, like today, um, the women get their, their fake hair from India. If they get, you know, now we can do synthetic hair. But back in the day, you had, of course, you had to get real hair. So just like now we get it from India, in Egypt, they got it from the Levant. So that they can make, because you can't cut black hair like this in its fro state and get this type of result. You have to get a different type of hair, curl it, and this is what you get. But this is this is the real here on the right. This is the this is the prototype. So when you see this sister and her braids and stuff, and you see the same thing over here, this is this is what they look like. This is the this is what the sisters look like over here on the right hand side, not what you saw at the beginning. And again, this quote unquote Nubian wig hair, these are real hairstyles. These aren't symbolic. These are real hairstyles of these folks who live in the area again, another afar. These, these aren't, these, these aren't your race, these aren't Berbers. You see on the right hand side here, this is a Ptolemaic picture of Osiris with the big ass Negro nose. This, this looks like the brother from Green Mile. 
And then on the left hand side, you see the hair. Somebody like this is a wig. They didn't wear their hair. You know, it's it's a wig for Egyptologists, um, or at least Eurocentric Egyptologists, because they know that their hair can't naturally do this. So it had to be some kind of style symbolic. No, this is what the real hair. So in the center here is a bust that was made in 1910 of a woman in the Congo. There's women in the Congo who still wear their hair like this, which you see here in ancient Egypt, the place where the Romech still live in Central Africa. And so this is here just to give an example, like when you're seeing these, these, these unique hairstyles, they're not just not made up out of thin air. They're, they're actual depictions of the hairstyles of the people. So just like how you see this is out of the Congo. You see here on the left-hand side how this hair is. And you see the woman on the right-hand side, this picture here. This is from uh, 1899. Right? Same hairstyle. And so they depict it in the artwork. So you see, and it's no different in ancient Egypt. So the, 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 the hair that you see here is the same hair that you see um, in the same hair that you see in the artwork is the same hair that you see in real life. And I had this picture here because when I saw this video um, of uh, some people in Ethiopia, this brother looked just like the statue of Ptah. I wish it was clearer that no matter what I do on the, the YouTube video, and I'll, and I'll probably share it in the links or in the description, you can see the brother out of Ethiopia. And so you compare all of that with, with these photos, these so-called reconstructions from 776 to 569 BCE. And then you compare them to the, the actual images in ancient Kemet. This is of Amenhotep III. Put it side by side next to uh, the, the Africans in the area. The same. This, this isn't, these are the folks. That's why their skin is reddish brown. That's what their skin color is. These are accurate depictions of real life. Even this man's fro here. You know, you had Chief X trying to really argue that this is a damn wig or a helmet. This is hair. And, and he said, you know, because you see the snake on here, that's an actual headpiece that you see right here. So this is, this is the exact type of, this one was found in King Tut's tomb on the left-hand side. But you see here with this uh, representation here, it's the same. You see the snake on the side. You see that right here. The, the circle, this goes around the fro. Even to the, you see the snake uh, zigzag on the top. You often see that in uh, some of the depictions of the artwork as well. And so it's, it's no surprise then when you go to the tomb of Ramesses III and you have a bunch of quote unquote Nubians here, but they're all called the Ramech. Because the Nubians are the Ramech. They're just a different type of Ramech. They're a different group. They're a different family. And so here, these are Deka. But you see them accurately depicted. You see them a little bit darker because they're a little bit darker than their brothers here who are more reddish brown that you see here. Well, all of these folks are just black, just different types of black folks. There's diversity in Africa and African phenotypes. But all the Ramech come out of Sudan. And so, you know, I have this here 
for those who 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 think that you know the the uh the the Mayans and the Aztecs were Africans and and misconstruing certain other people's arguments and then of course adding on not knowing that you know even their artwork accurately depicts on what they look like and these are not African people for those of you who live in 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 Texas and Oklahoma and Nevada and New Mexico and California you see these people every day. When you look at the Olmec heads, they look just like the folks that you see in modern Texas and Mexico because that's their ancestry. And so you got to always counter in convergence into play. The same thing here. Same thing with this woman here. They all match. So, you know, uh, for you black folks claiming that these all make heads, are, no. They they accurately depict these folks who are in that area and, who, and whose descendants still live there to this day. And so the the true, in, in like fashion, the true Egyptians, those quote unquote Nubians still exist in Egypt today. They all migrated and was pushed down into the land of their origins. And so with that, I complete my presentation. And so I'll stop sharing my screen and see what the hell y'all talking about in this dang chat. Let me see. Um, let me stop there. And he says, I remember said he used to say them people, not them. Poor Seti. Uh, what is this? DJ says about the word person Egyptian. We have uh, Aram, y'all, in early German mankind, and Uomo, or Homo, man in Romance languages might be a coincidence, but they would kind of fit with match. Um, it, it'll definitely take some, some work on that. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, Jehuti said, I went to watch this again. He caught me off guard with this one. <laughs> uh, Connie says, Hotep King, what about their hair depictions on the Omec heads? Uh, Brother Sar, those are actually um, feathers and summer braids, but they're, they're not they're not African heads. We're gonna have, we're gonna we have to leave the Omex alone. Let the Omex be. Um, let me see. Obi-Wan Kenobi's as the Sar did some of the migration out of Egypt lead to the Nult culture. I don't think the Nult culture, I don't know. I can't say, but that that's still up for debate. Um, because I I'm arguing the the I should say the evidence is looking at much of the metallurgy that that entered into this space in Nigeria. Because the Nok folks are just your Yoruba people. They're the ancestors to the Yoruba. And you can tell because in the in the in the note artwork, they still have the same scar, scarification symbols that the modern Yoruba, at least the ones who are traditional, is still carry to this day. So those the Nok folks are early uh people who came to be known as uh the Yoruba people. Um, but there is evidence that many of the people coming out of Egypt and Marotic. And, uh, and Moreau migrated to this area and and set up a guild of metallurgists. And that's another conversation for another day. Uh, he says, and I wouldn't want to claim things like the Mocha or so many other groups if people actually study how they get down. Yeah, them folks were, were booty bandits. And so y'all can keep them if you want to. And they refuse to even take the mental step. They just call everything pseudo that they can't understand. Indeed, excellent work, Asar. Thank you, and me, Cat, for joining. And peace and blessings to all the new folks who made themselves known in the chat. I'm trying to scroll up and see a few. I have to go back. Um, let me say, peace to me. Good. This presentation is a repeat for those in the back and have comprehension problems. I've done the presentation on the same a long while ago. Yeah, we got to keep having these conversations because people just, it's like they, they forget all this evidence. They'll just wait 
a little time before the conversation die down and then they'll start the whole conversation again with the same misinformation you know yeah no, i'm going this down thing so yeah i'm gonna find this down play <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting a few videos. You know, every time I do a video lately, you know, that I, I inspire response videos. So I'm, I'm you know, I'll, I'll view them when, you know, I have time. Let me say, uh, let's see. No, 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 I'm just going up here. Uh, da, 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 da. So, uh, granted, we allow such beautiful minds to not have to teach us kindergarten class over and over, and then we have to start all again. Indeed. Uh, don't worry, the next slide will be them talking and saying nonsense until the sun come up, confusing their chat and base. Yeah, you know, with them 40 hour long, I can't be doing 40 hour long uh, conversations because it, it gets, everything gets lost. And, and then you have 20 people on a on a conversation it just goes on in all different types of directions. We say, I don't understand how this conversation is based solely amongst us. And we could have you know, so much progression of conversation. Indeed. Um, let's see. Let's see. Tony Macaroni says, man, these videos between the squad and PK have been great. Appreciate it all. But I saw I've been fire. I appreciate it. He said, on the topic of leadership, the entire concept of race and highest use today is rooted in leadership. Exactly. You know, um, you say, say, this is a kill shot. <laughs> so I says, I'm oh, sorry, you're literally Morpheus. I named my car that, or I named all my cars that. So any car that I get is named Morpheus, which is uh, ironic. See if you said channel me handles if you say one channel so just can exactly. Uh, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to scroll up and see. Uh, he says I could tell who goes to white Arab Egyptology groups on Facebook and bring back their racist methodology to to black social media. Indeed. Uh, He says, it's Corey the anti theist says, so the Bible mixed with a little bit of lookership is sound methodology. Wow. You know, um, as I stated in the beginning, you, you know, for, for example, we know for a fact that the, that the Israelites were in Egypt, were they in Egypt under slavery and built the pyramids? No but we know that they were in there's there's context clues in their conversation that they could have only gotten as a result of being in the location uh in egypt and so that's 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 why we have textual criticism and critical analysis and you know we compare things with dates and people like they like the bible mentions shabaka and so shabaka is a real person and you know we do have records of Shabaka helping the 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 Semites, uh, you know, during this time of uh, colonization, uh, in in trying to keep you know the the uh, other Asiatics and and other folks at bay. And so you just gotta you gotta read, and and you gotta understand what is what is what is all fictional, and then what is what presents how is the myth situated in reality and then that's how you know and so again you know you there's there's clues in the bible uh that you can salute the song for one of the best to do this one or two appreciate it thank you and and so uh, he said if i go back and forth with so many of those modern egyptian errors on social media again like they they won't stand next to those those images that I show. So the the question that you got to ask them is how did y'all go from this to this? What what happened if 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 y'all are, you know, the same that nothing has changed that y'all y'all have maintained the same phenotype throughout the years. I say 
Some people only dispute this information because of their religious beliefs. This allows them to attack the information with a bias. Indeed. Uh, let me see. So the other side. Now we have to endure the torture of a pseudo killer's 24 hour marathon of complaining. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. I won't because I won't be watching. But uh, any brother, uh, any Harris says we do this twice a year. Uh, Sister Amy can't uh, stop relying on his teams researching ancient Egypt and to rely on look it up real quick on wiki team for their wiki info and we see the results exactly what was life like for the common man in Kemet we know the pharaoh lived good but where the pharaoh good rulers it really just depends you know and matter of fact there's several books uh, on that subject um, I can't think of the titles off the top of my head I have them though um, you know, matter of fact, there's, I think one is called like the daily life of the ancient Egyptians and it, 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 you know, gives you all of that. Let's see. Uh, so how much he says, uh, so how much power did the Ramech have in lower Egypt throughout the history? Um, I think the power fluctuated. So that's, that's how. You know, like especially in the in the two major intermediate periods, um, I, I think they they lost ground. And the first one was due to drought, and which caused instability all up and down the now. And then the second one was because of political instability. And I think after the second one, then then you know because the Hyksos the Hyksos were a group of Eurasians that took advantage of the insta the political instability that was happening in uh Kemet at the time and they just they just kind of rose up and just took power in the places in which they were already at they were already located there in the delta and uh so it really it really just depends on on what time period remember that you know ancient Kemet is over 3000 years of of history and so, you know, a lot of these questions and things really kind of depend on who, what, where, and when, and especially the when. You know, that'll tell you a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, he said, Noth in the Bible is Egyptian Nefer, for men Nefer, a.k.a. Memphis. All right. Uh, he said, Corey literally knows nothing about ancient Egypt. Stick to telescopes. I don't know nothing about telescopes either. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. How come so many words and all that languages in Africa are so similar? Is a split not that long ago? Um, that's that's a that's a long conversation, and, and you you can get my Luja volume two for a good summary of that of that argument. I mean, for that answer. Um, but yeah, that's that's a whole different conversation. Seeing John. Uh, you should skip past all this and bring a George Clinton build and let the funk mute the noise out. Okay, and then another it says contextual criticism is not understood by many or how to critique anything at all. Exactly. Um, I can't wait to see what I'm saying. This is going to be hilarious. He about to shrug his shoulders or laugh and stick his nose in the camera and be like, I think he made that up. Yeah, I drew all, I carved all the images of ancient egypt drew all those things uh i even went back in time and put those words in the bible as well you know that's that's just how i do <laughs> because the chief x is already a google images collecting evidence while unc has already figured out how many times he could use the word pseudo and a bunch of malarkey to make us forget the info in this video you know hey, let, let them do what they do Conan Lee says, question, how much can the study of modern Somalia reveal about ancient Egypt in your opinion? Um, I think it, it may bring some jewels. I don't think much because uh, of how long they've been Muslim. Um, and the Somali language is not really that close to Egyptian. Uh, so it's, it's a different branch of the language family, but related nonetheless. Um, but there, there's a lot. You know, remember, they... They were doing trade with each other. And so 
there there may be some stuff that we find that we're thinking is egyptian that may be you know from punt or somalia and um so that's something to consider so thanks for answering also any books or info on where those were matched elites went after the last shabaka dynasty um we have conversations all like some went down into sudan um some created the moro you know um uh kingdom some went further down and just migrated and just became normal people um you know there's there's a lot to say but some things we may just not never know you know uh let me see oops i'm sorry thank you already he says sorry did you see ned and Ned's video against you claiming that yahweh does not originate in africa I, I don't pay attention to Ned and Ned. Ned and Ned makes a video about me every week, uh, a post or something to that nature. He has no life. And so I, I just ignore him because he 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 has comprehension issues. And, you know, I don't argue with brick walls. And so he can make as many videos as he wants. Um, uh, that's how I'm talking. So anyway, so I've been good for, been going for like, one hour and 46 minutes so with that i would like to say thank each and every one of you for joining the conversation i will be back this weekend on probably on sunday and i'll be doing one of two uh responses to zion lex and his alleged response to the yahweh video and so, you know, we, we we have to have a conversation on why it's fruitless to have conversations with Hebrew Israelites because of the the mental handicap that comes along with accepting this this doctrine as reality. And you just you just start doing all kinds of making up stuff and can't read stuff and just put words in people mouth and don't understand stuff and then they come into the public and have conversations and so it, it is going to be a lesson on how to critique a hebrew israelite and then why you ignore a hebrew israelite so that's going to be on on sunday so be on the lookout uh for that and so you know if you have not you know uh been to the china into film.com website and made a contribution to the upcoming film uh china into where we'll be discussing things just like this uh, i would encourage each and every one of you to do so and you know the the funds will be going to the um to to help shoot some preliminary footage while i am in egypt for the uh returning to the source conference where professor smalls dr leonard jeffries anthony browder dr solange ashby dr rosalind jeffries dr wade nobles dr vera nobles his wife brother infodishi juhuti mess of course and myself oh and dr theo falobinga um, who will be at this conference and will be presenting. And so you'll get some good footage uh, of, of some of that conference. And it will uh, be very exciting. And so I'll be using some of that for some of the documentary, but mainly to, to put together a proof of concept trailer for the larger, you know, fundraising efforts. So I'm trying to raise $5,000 before um we leave in february we're just uh a little bit over two thousand dollars so you know any extra change that y'all have that y'all would you know want to donate please visit china into film.com so that we can make this happen so we can fight all the pseudo in the these media spaces uh with some right and exact info with uh you know introducing the the world to some of our most powerful scholars and scholarship and on the 15th and 16th of february i along with a number of uh very powerful scholars will be presenting at the conference it's an online conference that you can 
uh be a part of you know you just have to go to westafricabeyond.org the title of the conference is west africa and beyond ancient nubian and egyptian interconnections with the niger valley and the atlantic world and so you can register it's 35 dollars per day so you know put your coins together and view this live and you know uh it, it's going to be very 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 powerful and so when you know you'll see all the presenters uh there and you know uh i i guarantee you you will be amazed and so with that said um i am out see y'all sunday all right peace you see i have a lot of things a lot of things that's on my mind and i would like to let them out look i see reality breaking down all my fantasies it would be nice if i at least had one fantasy the neutrality about to take a terabyte from the american apple pie better get a slice it's kind of scary the way that this life is moving on marvin's doing big flips inside his grave what's going on we have head-on collisions not seeing another's vision maybe that's the reason why some colors fit the description a lot of relationships need life rafts sinking ships i guess you just can't have only one like potato the chips. I would love for you to listen with an open heart, but would you really even hear me if it's torn apart?